Good morning. You can go ahead and get seated. I wish we had time to pray together this morning, but we don't. There's a lot we have to do this morning. Um, see, this has to be the best sermon you've ever heard in your entire lives. <laughs> because A, it's graded for me. And B, I need you to bring 10 of your best friends next week here. So I've got to make sure I nail this. And in order to nail this, we have a lot to do. Like, I have to make sure that I give you historical context, because you know I'm in seminary now, and I've got to take the scripture and apply it to your lives, and then I've got to leave you with like the coolest, most profound one-liner you can put on social media. That's a lot. So we got work to do. We don't have time to pray. What a terrible way to enter the gospel story. So we should pray. Let's take a time to take a deep breath. Don't worry, I warned them that I was not devolving at the mic. (sighs) Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are in conversation with us, even when it feels too busy. Thank you that you are with us today. Be with us as we hear. Be with me as I speak. Just be with us. In your name, amen. Now, I know that felt a little weird. Thank you for laughing and not freaking out. I appreciate. But when we're dropping into the gospel story this morning, it's not that different from what's going on with the disciples. I'm going to back up a little bit and give you some context. The chapters before this in Mark, the disciples have just spent the entire time arguing about who's the best out of among them. And Jesus keeps going, no, like the greatest of you will be the least. And the response is, but I'm the best at being the least, right? (laughs) So this is the third time Jesus is about to have the same conversation with him that they have been having over and over and over again. This time, two gutsy, audacious disciples have walked up to Jesus and said to Jesus, we want you to give us whatever we ask. That's wild. I don't think it's that much different than how I pray, though, honestly. (laughs) But Jesus responds with such calm and grace and says, what do you want then? And they say, we want to sit at your left and your right hand in glory. Now, it's important to note this is not a simple request. The disciples are not merely talking about seating charts. The disciples are talking about power. See, in that time, the Roman Empire, congratulations, gentlemen, you get to think about the Roman Empire for 30 seconds. The Roman Empire was modeling what leadership looked like. Leadership for them was concentrated on conquering, on wealth. It was on power. But that was the model that they had of the day, that in order to change things, there had to be conquering. And as a result, they were still a little confused about what this Messiah thing meant. They still kind of thought Jesus was actually coming to conquer the people, defeat Rome, and set up a kingdom on earth. And they wanted a piece of that power. They wanted to be on the left and the right of Jesus when Jesus did that. They wanted to be a part of that authority that they were used to. And Jesus responds with a simple, you don't know what you're asking for. See, when Jesus thinks about left and right, we'll see that he is not thinking about our traditional models of power. Jesus goes, you want to drink from the cup I drink from? and be baptized by the water that baptized me? See, Jesus is not thinking about authority. Jesus is thinking about death. See, Mark is all about the heart of the gospel story. And as soon as we can get it, Mark wants us to get it. And this is the third time Jesus has tried to tell the disciples what's about to happen. Jesus is going to die for them for us, for me. And he wants them to understand what that means. See, when Jesus thinking about his left and his right, Jesus is thinking about one day someone will be hanging on a cross to his left and his right. 
Jesus is thinking about death. Jesus is calling the disciples to come to death with all of the powers and authority that they are used to. He's telling them to put to death those authorities that have been oppressive, that have brought people down, even ones they may have benefited from. This is a time of transformation of what authority means. And he's asking them, are you really ready to be a part of it? Because you seem like you're clinging on to your old ways pretty hard, because this is the third time I've had this conversation with you. And if anyone out there works with kids, you understand how that feels. (laughs) So I like to ask the kids when I tell them a Bible story, I wonder where you see yourself in this story. I wish I could look at you and say, not, I'm not the disciples. I would have totally got it the first time. But the reality is I am a disciple of God, and I absolutely would have missed it all three times. Sometimes I struggle to miss it today. It's hard to be called into leadership in the way that God is talking about. Because on one hand, you're called to serve people, and on the other hand, you are absolutely, as a leader, called to create tasks that empower people in management. There's a deep tension between these two, and it can be very confusing. It's really tempting for me to look out here as a leader and see empty pews instead of seeing the faces that's before me. I can miss the point of the story. The good news is that we know the end of the story of the gospel. Jesus doesn't leave us in death. Jesus doesn't even leave us in the death that he's calling us to be a part of. Jesus is ready to do the work of suffering alongside us, die with us, and resurrect. We know resurrection is coming and has come. And here's the wonderful thing about the false church Episcopal. We're a resurrection people. We know how to do resurrection. We've done it again and again and again. We, don't, we know the heart of the story. I also get an incredibly different perspective than most people because I'm going to seminary right now, which means I have a lot of seminarians coming and viewing our church to decide what is success in our church. And it's easy to feel like success is our incredible buildings, our amazing programs, our innovative thinking. But the number one thing they come back and tell me is, your people are amazing. Holy moly, your peace takes forever. (laughs) They really like each other. We know how to do fellowship well. We know how to unequivocally sit with each other and eat together. We're really good at brunch. And that's what they say. That's the number one thing they bring back to me on what is success. Your people are incredible. And I think that's because we actually know the heart of this story that we are resurrected people. We, need, we know that we can put to death old models that don't work, even if we benefited from them in the past. We know that leadership is not just about numbers, but about people. That we can put aside this idea that we have to do certain things because God has called us into fellowship with one another. I think just sometimes we get confused and forget we're resurrective people. But we are. So my question is today, if you take out the idea of these old models of authority, of what leadership is, and you enter a conversation with Jesus about relationships, about dying, to oppression and authority, being resurrected in fellowship and love. My question I leave you with is, where do you see yourself in that story? How does that change the way you see yourself today?